So I think, uh, so here we are want to talk about the decentralized self-sovereign identity. Actually, if you think about this, there are three keywords here, uh, which we are talking about. So we are talking about identity. So which we understand that every human being has an identity and that identity is used to basically uh, converse, exchange information with, with other humans or with, with other organizations. Then we are talking about self-sovereign, so self-sovereignty, which is about basically the ownership of the identity, right? Because obviously they, we, we as a human, we have a lot of different identities. Some, some of them are issued by governments. Some of them are issued by different organizations or we have some online credentials, but, but they, are, they are issued or managed by somebody else on our behalf. Uh, but when we talk about self-sovereign, it's it's about basically that as an individual, I am I own my identity and I'm in complete control of that. When we talk about decentralization, so decentralization is about uh, uh, how the information is managed, right? Because obviously it's about the storage of the information. So most of the systems in the world, they are centralized in the sense that they have a, a centrally located data center or they, they are using a cloud. Uh, but when we talk about decentralization, it's about how do you manage uh, information in a in a in a distributed way, and this is where the concept of blockchain and distributed legit, digital technology comes into play. So when we talk about identity, so the biggest problem with identity is that as of today, there are more than one billion people who don't have any form of identity, right? And this is this is from a, a report from World Bank, and then there are more than three billion people who don't have any digital identity in the sense that they. They are not uh, on the digital platforms. They are not participating in the digital economy. And this is what we are talking about in 2020, right? We are talking about industry 4.0, but then we are also seeing that there are over 3 billion people who are not participating in that industry. So this is a huge challenge. And also it's a massive opportunity because obviously now we can look at an audience, which is such a big audience. And then we can look at how to bring them uh, to the table. When we talk about digital identity, uh, digital identity is basically, it, it, it can be multiple things, right? So one is basically it's your personal information. So your name, your phone number, your email address, your age, so many other aspects about yourself. So things which can identify you. Then your biometrics or your online credentials, because these things are also unique for you. And you use these uh, things or these credentials to basically identify yourself uh, with certain third parties. Then insurance or medical records or even your financial information. So this is where there are a lot of pieces of your information which is uh, sitting across different industries and then they can be used to uniquely identify you. And this is where the concept of digital identity comes because this information is digital and this information is managed by different, different people, different organizations for you. But then obviously there are certain physical identities. For example, there's a passport, there's a driving license. And in certain countries you have an SSN or you have an Aadha. So those kind of form your physical identities and so some of them are digital as well. So when we talk about types of digital identity, right? So, so there are four typical types of identities. One is centralized identity, which we just discussed, right? So in the sense that uh, when a government issues your passport or a driving license, it's managed by a central central authority, and and they have the complete control over the process of issuance, as well as, as they can revoke it if they want to revoke it, right? So that is a centralized identity. Federated is where basically more than one organization comes together and then they they basically provide you an identity and it, it, it's accepted across uh, different organizations. User centric is where the user uh, has created an identity. And then they, they have certain control over it. For example, your Facebook account or, or maybe your account on other social media platforms. And lastly, the concept that we want to explore today is the sales or an identity. So which is something which is owned by you, which is controlled by you. So when we talk about uh, centralized identity in detail, it's basically, it's, it's an identity, which is again, as I said, right? it, it's, it's centrally managed, right? So, it, so the identity can be an identity of an employee which is actually managed by the employer, maybe a corporate or maybe a, a government body, right? So in that sense, that identity has been issued by somebody and they have complete cover control over that identity instead of the instead of the employee having control over it. Similarly, we are talking about contractors, we are talking about business partners. So the, the, the identity is issued by the organization and they, they have this control with respect to issuance and, and deletion of the identity. 
when we talk about federated identity so federated identity is like basically having one identity but that can be used across different uh, uh different platforms and and then basically uh, they they in, in that sense it's it's federated in nature right and uh, if you if you think about this for example you might have seen that you can lo log in with facebook on on certain on certain different websites right? or you can use your google identity to basically log in onto different online platforms so this is where facebook or google identity is being accepted by different other uh, platforms when they don't when they haven't issued it so this is where the concept of federation comes here when we talk about user centric it's mostly around an identity which the user has created and uh, it, it, they they use it in different aspects of their life right it could be uh, different online things that they do it could be dating it could be it could be the hobbies that they are doing it it could be basically uh, uh, their, their social life so in that sense it, it's 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 an individual who's controlling your the identity uh, without basically requiring a federation okay so self sovereignty is basically a, is kind of a new concept so self sovereign is where it's about the ownership right because the, the the four different identities that we discussed they were kind of issued by somebody and then you are using it but in this case you are you are you are creating your own identity and then you are able to basically manage it so in that sense you have complete control over it so the so examples are i think uh, uh, for example facebook identity is this kind of self sovereign identity in the sense that you can create your facebook account whenever you want it and you can delete that account uh, whenever you want to delete it but then it, it still lacks certain aspects of the self sovereignty because facebook might decide to to basically disable your account maybe because of certain things that you do on facebook right and same thing applies for linkedin so because it, it's it's a professional networking platform and then they, that is where certain controls are required so linkedin might disable your account as well right so it's it's a self sovereign identity but it's not not completely self sovereign in the sense that uh, uh, the, the issuing organization uh, still might be able to take it away but but again uh, it's it's self sovereign in the sense that you can decide to create your online account whenever you want to create it you can decide how to use it and then also you can delete it if you want to delete it uh when we talk about the key characteristics of a self sovereign identity now this is where i was trying to compare facebook identity and linkedin identity because there are quite a few things that basically kind of uh, define uh, a self sovereign identity so when we talk so it's it's basically it has to be minimalistic right so in the sense that when you are uh, because see, the purpose of an identity is to basically be able to share that with 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 somebody else so that they can validate or or authenticate whether you are uh, what you are saying or who you are saying uh, so in that sense it has to be minimalistic in the sense like i should be able to share minimal information about myself to basically prove something for example uh, on a, on a on a dating website i should be able to prove that i'm over 18 years right so in that sense i should be able to prove that i'm 18 years old without divulging my name or without sharing my passport so in that sense this is where the, the minimalistic concept comes in it's about resilience in the sense like uh it it should be resilient to censorship and deletion and this is where i think this is one check which facebook and uh, linkedin fails right because uh the face that organization can actually delete your identity or they can basically put censorship on that right so this is one check which those identities fail uh but they are still they can be classified as self sovereign because because the user has certain control over it when we talk and then it's more persistent right so nobody else can take it from you so it's your identity and you should be able to manage it in whatever way or form you want to manage uh portability so it, it's about that because now we we deal with so many different platforms right it, it's about there's so many different channels so it's like we are, we are we are talking about web technologies we are talking about mobile technologies we have so many different forms of uh, uh exchange mechanism that that we deal with so this is where that identity should be able to work uh, with with different technologies and different platforms and then also i think when we talk about because there when we talk about self sovereign identity there are many organizations which are issuing which are talking about that concept in the sense that your self sovereign identity should be able to work with those platforms as well consent consent is actually the key aspect here because as a owner of the identity i should be able to basically decide whether i want to share my information with somebody or not 
and this is where this is the this is the most important aspect of a self sovereign identity a uh, control so control is is about what control over the information right in the sense like the the, the life cycle of the identity the creation the management and the deletion and then also about about uh, the the privacy aspects as well and that basically takes us to the security right so it, it's about the privacy and confidentiality so i as an owner of the identity i should be able to decide what information i'm sharing with whom and when so i might be able to decide that i'm only going to share my name or my age or something else and and this is where it it has i i have the complete security in terms of the privacy and the confidentiality so this these are certain characteristics of a self sovereign identity and this basically makes it it, it it's it's a concept which is gaining lot of power but then i think uh, when we so i think when we started our discussion so we were talking about that there's a problem with respect to people not having an having a digital identity but then as soon as we issue a digital identity for example in india uh, the indian government issued aadhar which is a digital identity to over a billion people so obviously the benefit of that was that now those 1 billion people can interact or participate in the digital economy which drives social and financial inclusion but then since the data is now digital they are prone to uh, identity thefts and frauds so when we look at the different this this data is across uh, at 21st century actually it, it it's it's very very new so you can see that all the major brands or made all the major platforms have been breached at certain point in time right so you can talk about aadhar you can talk about facebook you can talk about uber so in that sense as soon as we become digital or as soon as we have a digital identity it's basically at risk because now 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 it can be stolen it can be misused and this is where i think uh, self sovereignty becomes important because as of today our data is owned and managed by certain bigger brands like we can face facebook has uh, over 250 uh, so, sorry 2.5 billion users so in that sense they are controlling the information of 2.5 billion users right and this is where the concept is how do we turn the tables and 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 we put control uh, in the in the users hand so i think in when we talk about a digital identity i think uh, we have certain solu solutions in the industry which basically help you manage your identity right so it's also from the organization's perspective with respect to managing the identity of the customers their users their employees or other stakeholders and it's also from the users perspective how do they manage or uh, and, and control their or secure their identity but then in that sense there are a lot of issues with with the, with the current problem with the current solutions right so most of them as i said earlier as well they are centralized so the information uh, is stored in a central repository or in a database or in the cloud which once gets once it's hacked it puts the the data of all those users at risk right for example when uh, when there was a breach uh, at aadhar the 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 data of 1.1 billion users were at risk similarly when you talk about facebook when when there's a when there's a hack or there's a breach uh the millions of records are stolen and this is where the 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 problem statement becomes very very huge because i think the risk is risk is very very uh, huge because of the centralization then it's also about uh the cost right so these identity management solutions are actually uh, as an identity in itself is 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 very costly right because it has uh financial repercussions it has social repercussions it has reputational repercussions so in that sense i think it's it's a very costly and complicated problem to solve then i think it's also about the 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 user or the customer experience uh, what happens is like when when as a, as a as a user when 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 you have an identity it could be a physical identity or digital identity you have that to basically avail different services right because you you are use, you are having an identity to basically prove that you are who you are who you are saying so that you can access certain services it could be public services it could be private services it could be digital services it could be social media services so you are trying to basically access certain services or access certain value and which is where you are using your identity but then because of having so many different identities issued by so many different authorities it becomes very very cumbersome right it's like i have i have five different physical identities which has been issued by my government then i have basically 20 different user ids and passwords which which i use across different 
online platforms. And then I have a few more things because my employer has given me an employee ID as well. So in that sense, I have so many identities to manage and I'm, I'm, it becomes very cumbersome for me. Then, all, then the next thing is like about a lack of borderlessness, right? So in the sense that most of the identities that we have, they have a specific jurisdiction in the sense that my passport is valid uh, in the UK. And then my uh, my Facebook account is this, my Facebook credit issues are only valid on Facebook. Then I have a user ID password for, for my Google account, which is only useful on, on, on that platform. And then I have certain other things which are very, very specific in nature, right? So in that sense, one, uh, if I have 20 different identities, each identity is actually applicable in, in one specific jurisdiction. That jurisdiction could be with respect to a country, it could be with respect to a state, it could be with respect to an online platform, it could be with respect to a particular organization, right? So this is where the there's a concept of border or jurisdiction, and this is where it becomes a problem. Because ideally, as a human, I should have one identity, and then I should be able to... Uh, carry that everywhere and I should be able to basically use that everywhere. The next concept is basically, so the next problem is about the reliability question. So I think we understand that when we talk about financial industry, we have a credit score or civil score, which kind of define uh, what are the, what is the strength of, of my financial history, right? In the sense like uh, what kind of loans I have taken, what kind of transactions that I do, how frequently I use my credit card. And actually, it defines a score which 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 can be used to basically assess the health of my finances. But when we talk about identity, we don't necessarily have that concept. And this this is this is kind of a problem because uh, whenever we talk about an identity, it's it's mostly binary, so it's true or false, so whether I'm Shiv or not. But then there, there are certain aspects which which can be measured about me in terms of my identity. And then certain decisions can be taken based on on that scoring. So we we should be having an identity quotient, which could help us basically, or the or the organizations or the service providers to take certain decisions based on that score that is associated with an individual. Uh, and then I think the lastly and the most important aspect I have kept it for the last thing, but but then I think it, it's about the compliance, right? So we all know about GDPR. So basically GDPR is the most stringent data protection guideline in the world, but then different regions or different countries have their own regulations as well, right? And, and, and then most of the platforms and even not just the identity management platform, uh, even the organizations, even the corporates or the businesses, most of them are not, are not compliant. And, be, and, and, be, and that becomes a massive challenge in the sense that uh, the, the cost of non-compliance could be in millions or billions, depend, depending on how big an organization you are. So I was working with a, uh, an organization a few years back, British American Tobacco, they are a multi-billion dollar company. And then if, if for, for them to be data, for them to be a GDPR compliant company, they have to spend millions of dollars. But then if they don't do that, they can actually, they, 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 might, they might risk billions of dollars in revenue as fines. So this is where you can imagine what is what is the, the, the size of the problem in terms of non-compliance. Okay, and now these are certain numbers with respect to, uh, uh, I think what we have discussed thus far, right? So the biggest number is 7.9 billion records uh, breached in 2019 itself. Uh, the global cost of fraud is $5 trillion and that is just 2019. Uh, on an average, uh, we manage 199 uh, username passwords, uh, and then, and then basically, 81% of the customer data which has happened due to poor passwords. So we can imagine, right? The problem is multifold, right? So as soon as we start talking about digital identity or or our data, the the, the problem comes from different aspects. It's, it's from the security, it's from it's from the it, it's it's from uh, from the channels. It, it's from basically uh, how we manage our information, how how strong passwords we have. So all those things. So that combined creates a very complicated problem for us. Okay. Now the solution here. So so as as we discussed, right? So obviously uh, we discussed about digital identity. So as soon as we start talking about digital identity, there's a problem with respect to the the data management as well as the ownership of the identity, right? So we can solve the problem of, 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 of data management or the, the security of the data through decentralization. 
and when we say decentralization it's it's about basically how you store the information how do you manage the information and okay so now when we talk about digital ledger te technology uh, uh, it, it it's about basically how do you how do you distribute the information in a way that it's replicated it it's shared it's synchronized and and then it it's also uh, we have a consensus in the sense that uh, all the users who are looking at that information they are looking at the same copy right so this is where the concept is that you are maintaining the information in a way that whoever is looking at it from wherever they are looking at it they are able to look at the same copy right or the same version so this is where it's about having one version of the truth but it's replicated across across the entire uh, platform so that uh, it's maintained and then it, it it's secured so in that sense there is no central ad administrator or there is no centralized storage uh, and this this basic this comes from the fact that a lot of times what happens is like when we talk about a centralized or the decentralized models the information is still managed by a certain administrator right and this is where they have control over how that information is is stored how that information is managed and how that information is is distributed right and this is where dlt technology or blockchain technology is about how to basically take that control or remove that uh, uh, one point failure or one point control okay so so distributed ledger technology is a concept and then there are multiple implementations of 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 that that concept right? and blockchain is is just of just one of them so blockchain is basically about how do you uh, how do you basically manage the data or the transactions in a way which they are, which which they are they are they are secure they are uh, they are in consensus they are in they are transparent and they are immutable right and there are different aspects right so uh, so uh, so blockchain is basically is a distributed ledger uh, where the transactions are replicated and they are basically uh, created in blocks and then those blocks are basically put together in a, in a chain of blocks and then blockchain also uses the concept of cryptography in the sense that the information that is being written or the transactions that are being written on the on the on the chain or on the on the ledger is basically encrypted and then it, it's basically it ensures that there is a there is a security security of the data because now we are talking about replication of the data across different nodes and in that sense if uh, there needs to be a security in terms of what is visible and what is not and then it's about the ordering of the data right in the sense like when multiple transactions are happening on the network then how do you ensure that uh, that the transactions uh, happen in a particular sequence in, in 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 the sequence that they were originally created and then how do you ensure that uh, duplicate or, or fraudulent transactions are not created so this is where the concept of consensus comes in and then i think uh, it's it's also about uh, what type of blockchains you can have right you can have public blockchain you can have private blockchain you can have consortium blockchain and it's about basically who can participate in in that particular uh, network right so uh, when we talk about a public network or a public blockchain it's about anybody can join join that network and then they can create transactions when when we talk about a private network it's about uh, having uh, maybe uh, earth id creates a blockchain for its own employees for let's say certain decision making right at the board level that blockchain only the, the employees of earth, earth id can participate and it's specific for earth id and and the decision making of earth id and then you have consortium right in the sense like uh, so a, a few organizations have come together and they have a, a specific a vision or agenda that they want to achieve together and then they can create uh, create a consortium and then i think as as i said earlier it there's there's no intermediary here right in the sense like there is we don't have the concept of one single organization or one single individual uh, having complete control over how the data is managed how the transactions are taking place and how the consensus is achieved okay moving on and i think uh, i think a lot of people in this uh, who who would watch this video they would understand basically these concepts already but i think uh, i think there's still a huge uh, huge percentage of people who might not know about these concepts so immutability right so blockchain when we talk about blockchain we also talk about immutability in the sense that the data that is being written on a blockchain or a distributed ledger technology that data is 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 cannot be deleted right or it's basically once it has been written nobody can remove it from there and this basically creates 
a unique opportunity in the sense that uh, it brings transparency in terms of what transactions happened and in what sequence. And we can take an example of a supply chain, right? So when we talk about the supply chain, there are so many different actors involved in a supply chain, right from, from the production of a good uh, to, to the delivery and to basically uh, to, the, to the sale of that particular good, right? And in that sense, there are a lot of actors and there are a lot of uh, activities and transactions that happen. And then because of this, there's a lack of trust. And because of this, there's a lack of transparency because sometimes problems happen and then there's a blame game. So when you have immutability, you can clearly figure out when you have recorded all the transactions in an immutable way, you can always figure out what happened at what time and who did what action, right? So in that sense, you're able to trace. Uh, with respect to uh, automation, so obviously I think we are talking about uh, a digital platform, which basically, which is able to record transactions, which is able to arrive at consensus itself. And it's able to basically uh, uh, create certain aspects, which, which are basically, which, which, which establish the trust uh, between different parties. And all this happens in, in near real time fashion, right? And then I think there's another concept of smart contracts. So I think when we talk about automation or we, when we talk about uh, trust or we talk about, I think uh, different processes that, that happen, right? So as of today, uh, there are a lot of contracts that, that we get into. And, and then I think this is where blockchain can provide another value where uh, through smart contracts, you can automate certain aspects, some certain transactions or certain business decisions, which make them very, very transparent and very, very trustworthy. And then I think it, it's about cost reduction, right? Because obviously if everything is automated and then the, the human involvement or the uh, is reduced and then also the, 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 the mistakes that, that happen, right? Or the, so those things reduce and also the basically the cost of the frauds that also reduce. So this is about basically how do you uh, how do you basically ensure that the use of blockchain basically reduces your actually optimizes your process and optimizes the the actors involved in all those processes and creates a cost reduction. Auditability, I, th I think it's, it's we have already discussed this that uh, we since we are able to create an uh, an immutable track of all the action that have taken place. So that that is where you're able to audit uh, what, what has happened and then and then basically arrive at certain decisions. Decentralized is basically obviously the data is, is spread across, is replicated across all the participating nodes. But depending on whether you're a public ledger or you are using a private blockchain, uh, the data would be accordingly replicated across all the different nodes that you have. And then at last security, it's, it's basically it's encrypted and then there's no single point of failure because since we have de decentralized, we, are, we don't have a single point of failure which, which most of the centralized systems uh, suffer from. Now, when we talk about the solution of our digital identity problem, so we discussed about self-sovereignty and we have discussed about DLT, right? And this is where when these two concepts come together, uh, we, we arrive at decentralized identity. So it's, it's about basically having an identity which is owned and controlled by an individual and the data behind that identity is decentralized. And that decentralized can be decentralization of the identity data can be achieved in different ways. So different uh, companies or different organizations which are offering decentralized identity, they have different models in terms of how the data or the information of the users is, is decentralized. It could be using mobile technology, it could be using uh, blockchain, it could be using uh, cloud, but then the, 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 the key point is that it's it's replicated and it's it's basically uh, it's it's replicated it's immutable and then it's uh, secure and and then we have auditability as well okay so when we talk about how decentralized identity works so obviously i think uh, there's a, there's this there's, there's there are three three key players in this ecosystem so you have an issuer you have a the person who actually owns the identity and then you have a verifier right so obviously I think it's self-explanatory, but then I think the issuer is basically who's issuing a particular uh, a partic particular aspect of the identity, right? Now identity could be, uh, the issuer can actually issue a complete identity. For example, Earth ID, it can issue an Earth ID, which is in itself an identity and which can be 
uh, which which might be trusted by different uh, organizations or different service providers. But an issuer can also basically issue uh, a verifiable credential, right? In the sense, like it could be a very small aspect of your identity, uh, as simple as that you are over 18 years old, or you are from, uh, let's say, from US, so you're an American citizen, or you are a male, or it could be that you are a graduate from this university, or you you basically you have a specific medic medical condition. So in that sense, uh, an issuer can be from a diff uh, from a from a different industry. Uh, uh, issuing a specific credential uh, for you, and and that and I think if you take the example of COVID nineteen situation, right? So there are a lot of companies who are working on a solution where they are issuing, they are talking about issuing a certificate or issuing a verifiable credential, which can tell whether a, a particular person has been vaccinated or not, or whether a particular person was quarantined and now he is basically safe to come back to the to the uh, to the workspace, right? And that becomes a verifiable credentials in the sense that the issuer has now issued that Shiv is Shiv has been vaccinated, and then somebody can verify that, right? And then somebody can verify, and then they can they can basically prove that yes, Shiv has been uh, vaccinated, and then he's safe to go back to the workplace. And this all all these things basically all these transactions they are basically managed over the uh, on on a blockchain platform as a registry, right? So this is this is where. Uh, the concept of verifiable verifiable credentials come, and this can be applied across different industries, right? You, uh, anything that 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 is that that can be proved proven or something which is a which is a trait of an individual that can be issued as a verifiable credential. So this this can this can apply to your vital records in the sense like your birth certificate, uh, your health records. It can also apply be applied to your educational. Uh, uh, educational background in terms of the university that you have been to. It could be about your work uh, experience that you have worked with so many different organizations for that matter. And then it, it's about basically uh, your your physical characteristics, right? In terms of your hair color or whatever. So, so this the sky is the limit in, in with respect to the the verifiable credentials that we can have. So this is where different industries are exploring different use cases with respect to what the difference different uh, credentials could be and then who can issue those credentials and who can verify those credentials so that an individual can basically pass on those credentials to uh, to somebody who's who's basically trying to verify those credentials before providing a specific service the simplest example is like i i want to prove that i'm over 18 years of age and before i can access a certain website Okay, I think uh, as I, as I was just explaining, there are a lot of use cases. Uh, but when we broad, broadly categorize them, I think uh, the biggest one is identity verification, right? Because we are talking about an identity which should be verified before we can access certain services, and this can happen across different different industries. And every industry has different regulations or different compliance in terms of what identity verification means, right? For example, banking industry talks about KYC, know your customer. And then even that has multiple levels, right? So it starts with zero, which is basically whether and whether whether that individual is living or not. And then you can have multiple levels where you are we are validating uh, an ID proof, you are validating an address proof, you are validating the financial health. So in that sense, you can have multiple levels of ID verification. And then one, when you talk about ID verification, it is tied to use, user onboarding, right? Because Whenever we are talking about a particular service or when we are talking about a particular product, before that is being sold or that that is being provided to individuals, there could be an onboarding process, right? Where you are you are you are verifying certain aspects about that individual before providing that service to them, and then this is where the the benefit of self sovereign identity comes because obviously once the because the identity is managed by the user and he is in complete control, this is where he can share specific information about himself in a very secure and seamless way, which basically results in a huge cost and time savings. Because instead of me handing over my passport, my driving license, and certain utility bills for you to basically do your uh, KYC in terms of my ID proof and my address proof, uh, which basically then it takes a couple of days. So. I, we all know, right? We have been to banks where basically it has taken us a couple of days to basically open a simple bank account, and then the bank had to spend basically a few hundred dollars 
uh, before before that process was completed. But with this concept, the the information is already verified. The information is controlled by the user, and then they can seamlessly seamlessly and digitally share that information with the bank, and then the bank can make quick decisions. So in that sense, it it it, it basically improves the entire offering. And then it's it's also about anonymized data, right? So in certain cases, as as I was explaining in you know in my previous slides also, there are certain aspects about me which I want to prove without divulging more information. So I can prove that I'm an adult, I'm a male, and and I basically I I live in UK. Uh, so in that sense, there are certain traits about myself which I can prove without even divulging any ounce of extra information. And this is very important, right? Because when you are when you are in certain conditions or when you are maybe when you are online and you are trying to do uh trying to access services and you have to prove certain things we end up sometimes oversharing and which actually creates uh, a situation where our identity can be misused and this concept about anonymization basically protects uh, protects you from those those particular scenarios because you might not be comfortable in basically uh sharing your passport within with an adult ent entertainment website right and this is where you just want to basically ensure that okay yes you are you are entered that so that is what matters to them and that is the only thing that you want to prove then it's also about access management and access management could be online and offline right so the other use cases that we discussed we were discussing about online access management where you are talking to different online platforms and you are proving that yes you are shared and then uh, then and then this is your user right your user username and you this is your password but then we talk about we take the same concept and we talk about physical access management because identity can work in both digital world and then physical world so you should be able to basically use your identity to even gain access to restricted areas right so you you might be going to a hospital you might be going to a corporate office you might be going to a hotel so you should be able to basically take your identity which is owned by you and you should be able to basically gain access if you have access right so basically obviously authentication on authorization if you are able to basically prove those things then you can use your ssi self sovereign identity to even achieve that uh and then there's a new concept of passwordless login so our thidi is, is is providing this use case and there are a couple of more industry organizations which are doing that and this is this is a very very i think uh, interesting uh, technology where uh, you don't have to basically create a user id and password for every every new online service that you try to access so in one of the side slides i have mentioned about that on an average we manage around 190 uh, combinations of user ids and passwords so which is not easy right it's very difficult to remember so many different combinations and sometimes we basically forget them sometimes we uh, basically we fall prey to phishing attempts right and this is and and also uh, there's a there's a industry study where the cost of a single password is is around is between 20 to 70 dollars depending on which region you are in and which platform you are talking about but then that cost is quite high if 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 you think about it and this is where if you can remove those online credentials in terms of passwords in terms of tokens that creates a very secured a uh, solution and a very cost effective solution so it's about once you have your ssi using certain technologies you are able to basically uh, again access to to online platforms without without typing in a user id and a password and that, then lastly digital id wallet this is this this is this is a concept which is being tried in certain countries for example india has this concept of digital locker where as a as a citizen you can add your uh, add your di uh, different identities to your mobile app and then and then you can basically use it uh, take it with you and then you can use it um, uh, at a different to to access different public services or go to different public offices and this same concept is basically so even our thidi is providing this where you can uh, create your digital wallet you can add all your identity documents and they get basically validated in terms of whether they are authentic whether they are validated whether they are uh, they are that they are tampered with and whether you own them or not so after all those checks and balances your document your identity is added to the wallet and you can carry that wallet everywhere right so instead of now carrying your passport your driving license your ssn or your aadhaar physically with you you can just basically have a digital copy of that and now you can basically share that digitally let's say at an airport or at a at a rental car or maybe at a hotel or in in, in so many different other uh, scenarios uh, so that you don't you don't end up 
uh, handing over your physical identity to a human being who might um, mishandle or misuse that information. Now coming to uh, industries, I think uh, we would all agree that uh, identity is a cross-cutting concern, right? In the sense that uh, every industry or every organization, uh, be it public, be it government, be it private, uh, they have employees, they have users, they have customers, they have different stakeholders. And all of those people, they, they have identities, right? And they have to basically manage their identity. But there are certain examples here on this slide, which, which are kind of uh, easy to understand and which are very, very, I think, relevant and very, very obvious, right? So for example, financial services. So we use our identity to basically open a bank account, apply for loans, uh, do trading, uh, take insurance products. So in that sense, this your digital or your self-sovereign identity can be used to basically to cater to these use cases. So you can basically do a transaction with a, with a bank or an insurance company using your digital identity. Then it's about education, right? So uh, when I was explaining about the concept of verifiable credentials, your UN university degrees could be your verifiable credentials in the sense that because see, uh, there have been frauds in the in the industry where uh, people have been basically forging uh, degrees from different reputed in industries to gain uh, good uh, good employment, right? And that creates a massive problem. And this is where using uh, this SSI concept and the concept of verifiable uh, credentials, universities or schools can issue uh, their degrees and their mark sheets uh, on blockchain, and that can become verifiable credentials for you. And then you can safely and securely share those credentials uh, with, with, a, with a future employer. So in that sense, it, it, it creates a safe environment. And, and then you can ensure that nobody is going to forge your certificates and and from an employer perspective, you 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 are at peace that yes, whatever information I am receiving, that is valid. In terms of healthcare, there are a lot of uh, startups which are working on SSI for specifically for doctors or patients. Where I think with respect to healthcare industry, one of the biggest challenges like the, the the data is, and I think this is true for most of the industries, the data is in silo, right? So my health data. It is also with my GP. It's also with my hospital that I visit. It's also with the lab which has conducted certain tests on me. And so in that sense, lot and also certain data which my um, Apple Watch is capturing, right? So this is where a lot of my data, health, da health data is spread across and they're not talking to each other, right? And this is where I as an individual, I suffer because if I'm, uh, if I'm basically getting medical services in UK. And then if I travel to certain other country, then that information is not traveling with me. And this is where a digital identity or verifiable credentials can work you be work with for you because now the silos are removed, the data is together. And then you are able to carry that data everywhere you go and you can actually get better services in terms of uh, healthcare. Travel and hospitality. So obviously I think there are a lot of use cases here. Uh, you can start with car rentals. So when we travel, we basically rent a car and then we end up basically sharing our passport or driving license with, with, the, the, with the individual at the desk, right? Uh, who might take a photocopy and misuse it. And this is where I think I would, I would be more comfortable sharing that digitally because then I'm sure, I, I know that that information is directly going into the system instead of being handled by, by that uh, receptionist. And same applies for hotels, flight bookings, check-ins. Um, so that... I am now very confident that my passport, my driving license and other aspects about me are not going to be misused or mishandled. So now talking about corporates. So obviously I think corporates is, is a very, very broad category. So corporates, we can talk about the employees of the corporate or we can talk about the, the users of the customers of the corporate side. And then uh, uh, and this is where an identity they instead of issuing an, a new employee identity for every every new employee you might be able to basically work with one one ssi which also ties up the the, the background information the employment history and so many and, and so many other aspects about that individual uh, and then that ensures that uh, when as as a corporate you are able to basically ensure that uh, you you have the right information about a certain individual Social platforms, I think this, this is very interesting use case because of whatever happening, whatever, whatever is happening around the world, right? We are looking at what is happening in US. We are looking at all the protests that are happening across the world. And then all the fake news that are being created 
uh, all the all the the accounts basic the fake accounts that have that are being created to basically change the results of uh, elections or maybe create situations which are not necessarily good for uh, humanity so this is where uh, an ssi or a unified identity can really help us solve the problem because if you have if you if you can inf somehow enforce that an individual can only create one account uh, on on a, on a given social platform then you are able to basically cut down a lot of fake accounts fake news and and lot of uh, other uh, issues and then you can also basically uh, create anti social behaviors because as i uh, discussed about the concept of a trust score right where it's it's like an identity quotient which can basically measure uh, how frequently you are using your identity and then what kind of behavior you get into it has its a negative aspect as well because we know that china is basically using a similar concept where they are assigning a number to every citizen and that could basically be used to restrict access to certain thing right which becomes then then becomes a problem right because now you are you are uh, reducing the privacy of the citizens but then obviously if you look at it from a positive perspective you might <clears throat> depending on the the information depending on your information and the and your behavior you might be rewarded right so for example on a social media platform if my trust score is high i might get certain discounts or or vice versa a uh, visa in immigration is 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 a very very interesting concept or i think i think a use case because obviously i think as of today it's a very very cumbersome process first of all to get a passport then basically getting a uh, getting a visa to travel i think it 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 creates a very unique uh, situation for us because it's very costly to basically get a visa right and sometimes the applications gets rejected because of lack of information or maybe maybe certain mistakes that you have made so in a way if we can create uh, if we can use ssi to basically ensure that the information that is being shared with the with the authorities is is correct and it's already verified pre verified information uh, and it answers all the questions that they are looking for then the process is is uh, become seamless and more optimized and then also the, the 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 aspect with respect to flow of information right because obviously i think when we talk about uh, immigration when we talk about international travel there are a lot of challenges with respect to i think illegal immigrants or refugees or basically maybe your visa getting expired when you are in different country right and this is where if you an ssi can solve this problems because then you are able to basically do a lot of things digitally and then also it creates a a very positive environment with respect to people who are in 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 certain unfortunate conditions like for example refugees so if you are able to basically give them a digital identity they would be able to participate participate or get access to different different relief funds then it's about uh, e-commerce and retail which is self explanatory so before accessing any any or buying products uh, or services online or even in retail store you can actually basically do that via your identity and then lastly government right so government has lot of use cases obviously we can talk about voting so a lot of countries are now kind of exploring the concept of digital voting or online voting but then they have this uh, challenge with respect to how do you ensure that uh, that there are no fake accounts and then there are no fake votes and then one individual is voting only once so this is where a self sovereign identity could really really help and then it's also about fund management right? so because of covid situation or because of protest lot of governments are basically creating trying to do create certain funds or 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 uh, relief measures uh, which sometimes get misappropriated right and this is where uh, an ssi can basically ensure that uh, uh, that with respect to the different actors participating in that distribution of of resources uh, can be traced that that would really help to streamline the process and basically reduce the fraud and then lastly it's about public services so i was having this discussion with the the chief digital officer of uh, dusseldorf city in germany and then we started discussing about ssi and then he 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 very candidly told me that there are when we talk about certain cities in in germany and actually this is true for like, all across the world right that when when a government or a public body they 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 basically provide services to the citizen uh, they end up creating new different identities for for them right for example when i am paying my utility bill i am paying my water bill i am paying my electricity bill i am paying for waste management i am paying for uh, let's say uh, uh, renting an e bike um, 
So this is where what happens is like I end up with so many new identities in the government or the public body and end up basically managing too many identities for the, the citizen. Then that is not necessarily a very cost effective or a process optimized process. And this is where a self sovereign identity could help unify all those identities so that as a government or as a public body, you are able to just work with one identity of a citizen. Because obviously, uh, when we talk about uh, certain when, when I'm a citizen of a particular uh, state or particular region, then I, I should be able to basically prove those things and then be able to avail the services uh, which are being provided in that particular region seamlessly. So in that sense, the, 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 the use cases are endless. There are a lot of use cases which I haven't even mentioned on this slide. And then you can think about them, right? With respect to online gaming, betting, gambling, so many different, so in that sense, wherever uh, the, the industries which are regulated or the industries which, which are high risk industries, that is where this concept can help really, really well. Uh, so I think this is, this is what I think, uh, I, I, I hope that I have, I've been able to basically talk about the, the, the three different concepts that we started with. So we started with basically the concept of digital identity then we wanted to talk about a decentralization and then we wanted to talk about self sovereignty right and how these three concepts can come together and solve the problem of identity which is basically a trillion dollar problem and then how can we basically improve the lives of different human beings with respect to social and financial inclusion because once you have a identity a safe secure identity you would be able to participate in the economy you would be able to you would be able to access different services. You would be able to basically get uh, funds. You would be able to do so many different things. And this is where it could drive social and financial inclusion. So that is all uh, from my end. And then if you have any further questions or if you want any more information, you can uh, you can reach out to me via LinkedIn or my, my email address is there on the slide.